one, and it's any one of the four criteria. So it's one, that the chemical is found in humans. Or two, the chemical is found in the household, the dust, indoor air, water, elsewhere in the home environment. Or three, present in fish, wildlife, or the natural environment. Or four, it's been banned somewhere else. So am I correct then that based on this criteria, you don't have to meet all four, you can meet any one of those four, that this would provide the statutory basis for the banning of a chemical that has never been found in humans, has never been found to be present in the household, shows up naturally in the environment, or has been banned from or has been banned by some other legislature? No, I don't think you're reading it correctly. Okay, it has do you have to, be, to, does it have to establish that it's found in humans? Doesn't it say any of these other four criteria? First, we're not banning chemicals. We're banning we are, uh, any child we are, product with that chemical. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I mean, in order to get to a priority chemical, you can have a priority chemical determination based on this language, even though it doesn't show up in, at all in It is not being banned humans, as a right? chemical. I think it's important to clarify that it is products that are the focus here that have chemicals that are harmful to children within them and that are part of their chemistry. If we tried to ban chemicals, that would be a different bill. We're not banning chemicals, and the very presence or absence of chemicals in any of the circumstances that you mention are indicators, any so, one of which can so help if guide I can the clarify department. that question then. Under this bill, the department can identify a, a chemical as a priority chemical, which would then trigger the ban on sale of certain children's products that contain that chemical, they can identify it as a priority chemical even though if it's not it is in, in children's human. products. Right. And it it does but not can identify affect that chemical in products that are not yes. for children. And by the way, there's so a I'm long list. The, I'm looking could, at the definition of priority chemical. Excuse real me, clear. gentlemen. This will work a lot better if we have a question and an answer and not a cross cut, uh, let the gentleman answer your questions. Uh, well, let me make the question clear. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for that guidance. Am I correct that on page five, line six, the Department of Health can identify a company as a priority chemical, can identify a chemical as a priority chemical, even though that chemical is not present in humans, as in indicated in lines 9 and 10. They could still identify as a priority chemical, even though that chemical is not identified in humans. Am I correct? You're partially correct, but I think the language deserves to be read explicitly. The, the department, in consultation with the Department of Health, may identify a chemical as a priority chemical if upon such review it determines that a chemical of high concern is present in a children's product. And then it goes on to say, and meets any of the following criteria, many of which you've already uh, put out before us. Uh, thank you very much, Engelbright. I, uh, Mr. Engelbright, I appreciate your comments on the bill. <clears throat> on the bill, Mr. Goodell. Uh, certainly uh, no one here wants children to be exposed to toxic chemicals that can cause a long-term health uh, problem. The problem with this bill is that the devil is in the details. This bill allows the Department of Health, in consultation with others, to ban, or more accurately, 
to identify a chemical as a priority chemical, which triggers a ban on sales of products that contain it to certain children, even though that priority chemical is not found in humans, even though that chemical is not found in the household, household air, household dust, even though that chemical appears naturally in the environment. Think about that. We give an administrative agency the ability to basically ban toys with a chemical that doesn't show up in humans, that doesn't show up in the household, that's naturally occurring. It seems to me that we're not doing our job as legislators if we don't provide clear, precise guidelines on what should be in and what shouldn't be out. And uh, I'm also concerned that this bill says it's okay to sell toxic toys if you have less than five employees. That's in this bill. That's kind of wild to me. And we provide that it's okay to sell those toys if the kid's over 13. For these reasons, while I appreciate the improvements made by the amendments, I would recommend some additional amendments, Mr. Speaker, before we vote in favor of this bill. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Goodell. Read the last section. This act shall take effect on the 120th day. Clerk will record the vote. Mr. Titone, to explain his vote. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think this is a really a uh, good bill, um, although I would uh, request that the uh, sponsor in the future consider amending the bill to also include pet products, not only for the uh, well-being of dogs, cats, and pets that we keep, but for children once again, because Children do play with their pets who play with toys that do have uh, toxic uh, uh, components to it. So I, I think it's a great bill. My only thing is that I would ask that the sponsor consider amending to include pet products. Other than that, I withdraw my request, Mr. Speaker, and will be voting in the affirmative. Thank you. Mr. Titone, in the affirmative. Mr. Engelbright, to explain his vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The most important thing that, arguably, uh, that we can do here is protect the most vulnerable members of our society and our state. That includes our children, our entire future. The future of everything in our state that we care about is in the hands of our children. It is those trusting children that expect us to act prudently and I believe that this legislation is a step in that direction. I believe it is prudent for us to have a process, which this bill calls for, which leads to the elimination of contact between our children and their tissues and their developing immunization, uh, 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 immunity systems uh, with toxic substances. This bill is an important step toward protecting our most important resource, which is our future and our children. I urge all of my colleagues to support this legislation, and I will work uh, with uh, our friends in the Senate to reconcile any differences uh, or, or, uh, pro uh, or problems that may be identified. But I haven't seen any of those problems so severe in this debate that would cause me to recommend anything other than a yes vote. Mr. Engelbright in the affirmative. Mr. Walter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Give me the opportunity to explain my vote. Um, as a parent, I reject the implication that by opposing this bill, uh, I want my children to handle products that are unsafe. Uh, in fact, what it is, it's a radical left-wing agenda to destroy jobs and to chase more and more of our companies out of New York State. Hardworking people uh, in Western New York who work for uh, good companies that create great products that aren't 
have anything to do with keeping our children away from these chemicals. I don't know how many parents in here have ever to sue the child, handed them their keys and, and jiggled their keys in front of them. Well, under this law, those keys that you're jiggling to your child to help uh, soothe them if they're upset would be unsafe products because of the naturally occurring uh, elements that are in those keys. A phone, forget it. This is, this is probably the most dangerous thing that each and every one of us has in our pocket. It's deadly with all the chemicals that are created in our phone. God forbid you hand it to a child. Uh, it's just ridiculous to even imply uh, that this will do anything to make our children safer. And not only that, but by piecemealing this type of legislation, uh, state by state, we're doing no good to anyone because we're not really keeping uh, any products out of the commerce stream in the state of New York. Uh, this is something that should be handled by Congress. It should be much better thought out than this bill is. Uh, and for those reasons and many other, I vote in the negative. Mr. Walter, in the negative. Are there any other votes? Announce the results. Ayes 94, noes 21. The bill is passed. Assembly 3063, calendar 139, Mrs. Peoples Stokes, an act to amend the environmental conservation law. An explanation is requested, Ms. Peoples Stokes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. This bill um, would require that there is a permanent environmental justice advisory group established for the purpose of keeping up and paying attention to the issues of the environment as they impact mostly minority communities. Uh, it, would, it establishes state policies, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it defines environmental justice. It has a 17-member environmental justice advisory group, which is made up of uh, the minority members, the majority members, and community members as well. It, it provides for a... Um, it authorizes whether the advisory group to adopt a model, the environmental justice policy, within one year of its effective date. And so this is a, a board that we've been asking for for some time now. It um, will have a short period of time to pull together uh, some recommendations that will move this issue forward in our state. Uh, I should note also, uh, Mr. Speaker, that this advisory group, the environmental justice advisory group, was the creation of an advisory group that came based on a 2002 environmental justice task force that was put together by former Governor Pataki. Um, it was necessary then, and it's necessary now. And so I'm urging my colleagues to vote in support of this legislation. Ms. Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the sponsor yield? Will you yield, Ms. People Stokes? Yes, of course, Mr. Sponsor Speaker. yields. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, I appreciate it. I know we've been through this bill a couple times in the last few years, and I, I'm just wondering, have you had an opportunity to go back and look at the um, uh, Department of Environmental Conservation? They have a, uh, a department called the Office of Environmental Justice, and I'm just wondering what is it that their, their role is? Uh, yeah, I, I have, and I, I do know that they don't necessarily work uh, interagency-wise with other, organs, other agencies. This uh, advisory group would do that, including the um, Department of Economic Development, Department of Transportation, Environmental Faculties, Facilities Corporation, NYSERDA, the Public Service Commission, and the Office of Science Tech. So this is a little more broader than what they do right now, and it has a broader impact. I see. And uh, you had mentioned earlier that Governor Pataki had uh, formed a, a task force back in 2002, I believe it was. Um, I also understand that Governor Patterson had created a, uh, he called it the Environmental Justice Interagency Task Force in June of 2008, and they had published a report, and I'm looking at it right here on, uh, on the internet, and it is called, 
uh, environmental justice issue brief, New York State Energy Plan 2009, and it uh, details rather specifically policies and uh, procedures that should be followed. And I'm wondering uh, uh, if this was ever implemented or if these, uh, these uh, measures were ever incorporated into the Office of Environmental Justice program. Uh, actually, it was. Jane, it was, uh, as a matter of fact, that exact same report recommends a uh, advisory group, an environmental justice advisory group, very much similar to this one. Okay, because uh, my read of it is that it, um, it has uh, the office already, what it does is it encourages community participation by having community members come and report or uh, comment on the proceedings of the Office of Environmental Justice. So I guess I'm, I'm kind of confused. It seems to me that we have an office already and perhaps it's not working effectively, and certainly that's, that's entirely possible, um, but I, I'm not under, understanding why we should create a second one well, if the first one's not working. Let me make it clear. The office that we have already does not have all of these components in it, one. Two, um, it may have a community, community component, but it doesn't have a legislative component, either minority or majority. Uh, this one does, and it also has multiple agencies that are required as well. I see, okay. So that, that's the difference. It's, oh. it's more comprehensive, and hopefully because it's more comprehensive, we'll get a better result, and we can actually begin creating uh, not only an education process for communities to be healthier, the people who live in the communities to be healthier, but we can make recommendation policy decisions uh, based on those factors that could negatively impact the people who live there and perhaps get a healthier community. Sure, absolutely, and I agree with you. Um, that's certainly something we need to do. I, I guess I'm just trying to figure out the most efficient way to do it. I think my concern here is we create government agencies and task force and committees, and they all work independent of each other, and uh, no one really ever gets anywhere. And I, I'd like to see policy implemented and effectively uh, change uh, for the better in the communities. Perhaps it would make more sense to um, address the Office of Environmental Justice and to open up uh, their uh, membership and get more interagency impact. Um, certainly, I think they have a lot more influence being in office within DEC as opposed to being a separate task force. Well, can I suggest to you that if that was their desire to, to get a better outcome, that they would have already created this on their own? They haven't. And so sometimes I think these agencies need direction, and I think we need to provide it for them. Okay, certainly. And uh, one other thought I have, too, is um, I understand the need. You're, talking in terms of advisory, it seems to me they've already gotten their uh, recommendations down and they've had them for quite a while. Perhaps what would make more sense is that we have some sort of an enforcement opportunity. It sounds to me, based on reading this, this document, that they, it creates the office. It uh, very specifically creates the policies. The problem we have here is nobody's enforcing them. And perhaps what would make more sense is having an enforcement task force as opposed to a, an advisory. Well, this task force is going to be charged with making its recommendations in, within one year, and I, I would, um, you know, tend to agree with you. Once those recommendations are made, we should attach it to enforcement. Okay, great. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Read the last section. This act shall take effect January 1st. The clerk will record the, the vote.
Are there any other votes? Announce the results. Ayes 90, noes 24. The bill is passed. Assembly 3382, calendar 149, Mrs. Peoples Stokes, an act to amend the environmental conservation law. Read the last section. This act shall take effect immediately. Clerk will record the vote. Are there any other votes? Announce the results. Ayes 104, noes 7. The bill is passed. Assembly 5844A, calendar 221, Mr. Kavanaugh, an act to amend the environmental conservation law. An explanation is requested, Mr. Kavanaugh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. This bill would set a uh, certain maximum standards for the amount of mercury that can be contained in uh, common lighting products. Uh, mostly uh, those uh, include fluorescent light bulbs, both the traditional long tube bulbs and also compact fluorescent bulbs. And it also has provisions uh, to allow standards to be set going forward uh, for mercury content uh, for other types of bulbs. Uh, mercury, as you know, is a highly toxic product. There is no way to make uh, bulbs with these kinds of bulbs without mercury that's uh, known at this point. So the idea is to continue to have those uh, bulbs produced, but to produce them with the minimum amount of mercury in our uh, in the households in New York State brought in by these bulbs. Uh, these standards match those of several states uh, already in place, and we think it's a reasonable uh, accommodation of the industry and the needs of New Yorkers. Mr. McEvitt? It will sponsor yield for just a few questions. Will you please. yield, Mr. Kavanaugh? Certainly, Mr. Speaker. Sponsor yields. We briefly debated this bill last year. We had the same conversation about the fact that um, yeah, there was a there's currently a Senate sponsor uh, to this bill at this point, which hasn't moved past the Senate. There was a previous bill in the Senate under another senator, which was very similar to yours, but I think one category did a change in some milligrams, um, which you know, again from your perspective still create more mercury in the landfill you wanted to. And just my concern is, my feeling is there should be a little more urgency maybe about getting on board with the Senate for this reason, that it looks like with the CFLs, the, uh, the fluorescent light bulbs, compact fluorescent light bulbs, are quickly becoming obsolete. Uh, I make the point that GE, at the end of this year, is going to cease manufacturing CFLs and go completely to the LED, the light emitting diodes, which don't produce any mercury, which I think is a good thing right. for two reasons. Number one, the LED bulbs are much more energy efficient than the CFL. And number two, from an environmental impact, there'll be much lesser impact from the LED because they don't produce mercury. So I guess my concern is the longer we delay in getting a compromise with the Senate, 
that this bill will almost be obsolete. That's just a concern I have. Yeah, th so this, this bill does have a Senate sponsor. This exact version yes. of the Senate sponsor, uh, it is a member of the minority over there. The previous bill, which was intended, as I understood it, as a compromise uh, from the majority of the Senate, which I do not believe has been introduced in the current session, right. uh, but that bill basically was suggested by the industry, and it exempted the, the, the one category of bulbs they exempted entirely was compact fluorescent bulbs, which we know at that point were becoming much more common than those old long tube bulbs and much more common in households. So we think that the, the intent of this bill is to address the mercury permitted in compact fluorescent bulbs. Obviously, if they cease to be on the market, that restriction won't be necessary. But at the same time, it also won't be a restriction that affects anybody if they're not manufacturing these bulbs. So the, the, the anticipation uh, that is built into the, this bill is that some kinds of lighting products for some significant period will continue to have mercury. And we, thought there ought, we think there ought to be maximum standards. If you're not manufacturing them, it shouldn't be your concern. And I will note that neither GE nor the National Electronics Manufacturers Association, which has in the past opposed this bill, um, is currently opposing uh, this bill, to my knowledge. Right. Again, we, and, but it's interesting how, again, we have standards. And again, I think the intention of your bill is very good, and it's a goal we should be moving towards. It's just, I think, maybe ironic, maybe or not, that the industry may hopefully solve this problem for us in the meantime. Well, and we would, they work out. Yes, and, and again, it is, it is important that we support energy efficient products like LEDs. Um, a bill like this that restricts the amount of mercury in competing products may help uh, industry see the light and uh, no pun intended uh, and uh, use more efficient products. It may well be that the fact that states like California have taken action on restricting mercury have spurred the market to come up with better products like LEDs. But we think that given that many of these products are, are still sold in New York, we expect they'll be continue to be sold in New York for some time. We think it's important that we limit the amount of this very toxic product in our households. Okay. And again, even if you didn't mean seeing the light was an unintended pun, as an intentional pun, it would have been very good as well. So, well, makes the point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Read the last section. This act shall take effect immediately. Clerk will record the vote. Are there any other votes? Announce the results. Ayes 106, noes 7. The bill is passed. Assembly 9289, calendar 410. Mr. Simbrowitz, an act establishing a moratorium on the Department of Environmental Conservation's plan to declare mute swans a prohibited invasive species. Read the last section. This act shall take effect immediately. 
Clerk will record the vote. Ready to ready. Are there any other votes? Announce the results. Ayes 100, noes 14. The bill is passed. Mr. Morelli. Yes, Mr. Speaker, do we have any resolutions to take up at this time? Oh, certainly, Mr. Morelli. Numerous fine resolutions. We'll take them up in one vote. All those in favor of the resolutions, please signify by saying aye. Opposed, no. The resolutions are adopted. Mr. Morelli. Thank you for your enthusiasm in passing those resolutions in a timely manner. Uh, I now move that the assembly stand adjourned until 10.30 a.m. Thursday, May 5th, tomorrow being a session day. The assembly stands adjourned. <laughs>